Well, good morning, Providence. It's really good to see you. Whether you're here in this room or you're worshiping in another room on our campus or you're joining us online, welcome. We would love to be able to help you get connected here at Providence, and we have a couple ways that you can do that. One is the blue card that's on the seat back in front of you. You can fill that out, and you can take that out to the welcome desk in the lobby after the service where there's people there that would love to uh, meet you and help you get connected here. Or if you're joining us online or you just prefer a digital option, you can go to pray.org slash connect. And there you can give us some of your information, and we look forward to reaching out to you. Well, this morning we have the joy of celebrating some of the youngest lives here at Providence as their parents come to dedicate them to the Lord. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, we find uh, just the beautiful story of Hannah, who was longing for a child. Um, Hannah then responds once God blesses her with a son, and this is, how she, this is what she says. She says, for this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And so Hannah recognizes that her son, Samuel, is a blessing and a gift from the Lord. And so her heart and her response is to return him or to dedicate him to the Lord and the purposes that God has created him for. And that is exactly what these parents are doing here today. This time of child dedication is a chance for all of us to celebrate these new young little lives. It's a chance for these parents to ask for God's hand of blessing in the lives of their kids as well as for them to uh, dedicate themselves to be godly moms and dads who are gonna point their kids towards Jesus. It's also a time for us as a church to commit ourselves to help them in this parenting and this discipleship journey, as well as for us to commission them as the primary disciple makers of their children. So uh, I see phones with cameras and taking pictures. Uh, I think it's time to introduce uh, our families here and our cute little ones. So I'm going to start right here. Here we have Ellie Jane Carper and her parents, Ray and Ashley. And then next, I have Joseph Scott Linger and his parents, Noah and Meredith. And then here I have Emmett Christopher Morkum. He's looking the other way. He's looking at himself on the screen. <laughs> His parents, Chris and Allie, and big sister, Corey. And then here we have Emery Elizabeth Trampy and her parents, Ian and Anna. So can we uh, show them uh, our appreciation for them, our support for them, that we love, we care for them? Just so you know, we've dedicated 13 children across our services this morning. It's really been a sweet time. Uh, but parents, I now want to ask for your commitment to the spiritual leadership of your children and their dedication to the Lord and his purposes. So parents, do you recognize these children as a gift of God, giving thanks for his blessing, and acknowledge a dependence on him for their upbringing? Do you commit to make it your regular prayer that by God's grace, your children will come to trust in Jesus Christ alone for forgiveness of sin? And do you pledge as parents to raise your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, making every effort with faithfulness to build the character of Christ and the joy of the Lord into their lives? And lastly, do you now dedicate your children to the Lord, submitting to his purpose for their life, that they may be a blessing to him and to others? Amen, that's incredible. Now, church, we are an important part of this moment and this journey of helping uh, to teach these kids to love and worship God. Uh, God has not left these parents to do this task on their own. They need help. They need our help. They need a body of believers who are going to love them and support them, encourage them, lift them up. They need a body of believers who's going to teach God's word, who's going to lovingly serve one another, and who's going to be another voice that points these kids towards Christ. So I want to ask for your commitment to this responsibility and to these families. So church, do you commit yourselves as a family of faith to partner with and support these parents, to walk alongside them with encouragement as they point their children toward Christ, committing to live as examples that show what it means to value Jesus as our Lord, our Savior, and greatest treasure? If so, answer, we do. Amen. Thank you for that. So now, would you join me as I uh, go to the Lord and pray a prayer of blessing and dedication over these children? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for uh, today, this place, this time, this moment right now, and what it represents. God, we thank you 
for the young lives that are up here on this stage. God, we recognize that they truly are a blessing from you, a blessing to this family of faith and a blessing to these parents. God, we pray for your hand upon their lives. We pray that you would bless them. God, that you would care for them, that you would protect them. And ultimately, God, we pray that one day you would draw them to you where they would turn to you for forgiveness of sin as their personal Lord and Savior. God, that is our heart's desire. We ask you for that. God, I thank you for the parents that are standing here. Um, God, I thank you that they know you, that they love you. I thank you that um, they are taking this step at the beginning of this discipleship journey to stand up right now and commit to raise these children to know and to love you. So God, be with them. Guide them, direct them, bond them together in their relationships, in their marriage. God, may they be unified. God, give them the right next step day in and day out and the encouragement and the strength to continue to point their kids towards you. God, I pray for this church. God, I pray that we would be the partner that these homes need. God, that we would set an example to these lives of what it looks like to be people who know, love, and follow you. And God, may we be willing at any time to open our mouths to teach and to tell and to point these kids to Christ. And lastly, God, we just want to dedicate these children to you. God, we dedicate them to you and the purposes that you have for them, for the reason why you created them. God, not our will, but your will be done. May their lives glorify you in all things. So God, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for the gift of family. We thank you for the gift of church. And we thank you uh, for these families and these children now. So we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, can we thank them and show our appreciation for them one more time? Thank you guys for being a part of this and your commitment to them. It really is a beautiful thing. And so it really is great to be here together this morning. So right now, why don't we all stand up and let's sing praises to God together. Well, the scriptures say that the Lord is holding all things together through the power of his word. That includes us this morning, that we're here for him, by him, and because of him, let's sing. Still my soul will 
we are here because of your merits this morning. Lord, we are, are not good enough. We are not holy enough. We are not obedient enough, Lord, but we confess, Lord, that it was <laughs> our mocking voice, Lord, it was our sin that, that, that kept you there. Lord, but we know that's not how the story ends, and so we stand on this side of the cross. Lord, grateful that you would make many sons, that you would have many sons in glory. Show us that you love us. Help us to understand and believe it, to receive it this morning. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. Hey, I'm Tyler, and we want to say a good morning to you. We are so glad that you're here. We know that Providence is big, and we know that you can easily feel lost. There's something really special about feeling known and growing with others. And we see that happen in small group communities that we call life groups. If you wanna learn what life groups are all about and other growing opportunities that we have, join us next week for the growth step of the Providence Pathway. Things will kick off next Sunday at 11 o'clock. Well, Providence family, it's great to see you. Hope that you've had a really good week. Um, really glad that you made the choice to be here today. And if you are a guest with us in this room or some other room, uh, welcome. We're glad you were here with us. Um, I know this is abrupt, but let's pray. Father in heaven, we bow before you today as the maker of all things, and we uh, want to submit to your word. One of the many things that your word says is to pray for the peace of Israel. And so we want to be faithful to do that today. We ask for peace. Lord, we confess to you that even the very promise in your word that tells us that that region of the world is going to experience increasing hostility until the very end of the days here on the earth, we need you to keep us from becoming numb or jaded to the pain that people are experiencing. And that region of the world that is so frequent with tension, it's just so easy for us to hear of more tension and really not grieve about it. But we know that there are hundreds of people who have lost their life, which means that today there's tens of thousands of people who are grieving the loss of a loved one. And we know that many people, most people, on either side of that border have no regard for Jesus Christ. They do not see how he is everything, how he is the savior of the world. And so we pray for peace and we pray for spiritual peace that you would open up people's eyes even in the midst of conflict and strife and anxiety and loss and grief and that you would meet people where they are at. And we pray for leaders around the world and in that region, Lord, that you would give them wisdom and understanding to be able to pursue peace. As we open your word now, we open to a passage that you know doesn't feature a lot of peace. It's a strong warning, and we believe it's from your good heart. And so would you help us to be able to absorb it, to believe it, to apply it, to have enough courage to apply it? So would you give us understanding? Would you give us the courage to avoid what we need to avoid? Would you please help us? And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're in a series, uh, it's called Pass It On, and we're simply walking verse by verse through this book of the Bible, and we're up to chapter 3 and verse 1, and so it's important you understand, if this happens to be the first time that you're here, it's really good for you to know that the Bible is written with books, and those books have chapters and verses, and, uh, and they're written in order, and so uh, we try as often as we can um, here to look at books of the Bible and just kind of work through them. 
Um, one of the things or the great benefits in doing so um, is you can't avoid anything that's there. And so when we say this is where we're at, this is where we're at. And today is a really strong warning for all of us that, um, that we need. You know that there was a time in our culture where it was pretty respectful and even agreeable to a worldview that flowed out of the pages of the Bible. In addition to our culture, the, most of the churches within our culture were not only convinced of, but committed to the Bible's authority, to the exclusivity of Jesus Christ and his ability to save, to personal purity and holiness within the church. And America has long since abandoned the fetters of God's protection, his instruction over us. But not only that, a counterfeit spirituality that masquerades as godliness has crept into many churches that denies the power of God, the truthfulness of his word, and his expectation in calling us to pursue a life of purity and holiness. And Paul warned us of this a long time ago. For those of you who are brand new with us, this letter is written by a man named Paul. And Paul, at the time that he wrote it, is in prison. He's chained to the floor and he is condemned to die as a prisoner of Rome for his faith in Jesus Christ. He knows he's going to die and so he chooses to take his last few days or hours, we don't know exactly how long, to write a letter, and he's written lots of letters. Most of the letters that he's written are written to churches, lots of people that's to be read to lots of, lots of people that he knows. Some of the letters are actually written to a region in the world where there's lots of churches, and he even says in there, now I want you to share this letter with all the other churches to give instruction as to how to walk in the gospel. But this last letter he writes to Timothy. His son in the faith, a man he has mentored for almost two decades. Paul's in his 60s, and this young man is probably somewhere in his 30s. He's been pastoring a church in Ephesus where he's been fighting for the truth and fighting against heresy and false teachers, and he's exhausted, and he knows that his mentor is about to die for his faith, a faith that he's holding on to, and the letter is literally a passing of the baton. He, what he's saying is, I'm about to die, and so I'm giving you the personal responsibility of carrying on the mission and organizing people for missionary work to take the good news of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. And the good news being that even though that we have sinned against God Almighty and have accrued a moral debt with him that we cannot pay, that God in his love for us sent his son Jesus Christ to the earth and he lived without sin. And he went to a cross and there he died for our sin. In our place, he was buried in a grave, and on the third day, he rose from the dead, extending an invitation that if we would put our faith and trust in him, not our morality, not our good works, not our religion, not our effort, not in anything that we bring to the table, but exclusively in his righteousness, in his death, his resurrection, and in his promise that he would take away our sin and give us his righteousness, that we would put our faith in him. And what he says is this, everyone who does that, Everyone who bows the knees and confesses him Lord of all here on the earth, saying, I'm a sinner, I can't pay my debt, he forgives our sin. He gives us his righteousness. He brings us into his family. He gives us the gift of eternal life. Paul could not stand the thought of dying without this message reaching to people who have never heard it. And so at the very end, he knows Timothy happens to be in a hot spot. He knows he's exhausted. His soul is, is tired. He's fatigued. He's hesitant to take the baton. He knows that taking the baton could lead him to lose his head just as his mentor is about to lose his. And in the midst of this letter, so full of compassion and courage, he gives Timothy and through Timothy to us this warning. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, 
disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the form of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jane Breeze opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith, but they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. In those nine verses, if you read with me and you paid attention, you noticed that there was a lot of explanation given to things that are around him but he only gives Timothy in those nine verses two direct instructions of what he must do. One of them is to understand something, and the other is to avoid something. And everything else is built to help him to understand and to know what to avoid. And so we're gonna build this whole sermon around those two points. First, let me urge us to understand the roots of counterfeit spirituality. There is a counterfeit, there is a fake spirituality that is intentionally pumped into the hearts of people around the world. And we need to understand their roots so that we can identify what is counterfeit and what is true. Paul's warning in verse one is so crystal clear. He simply says, understand this, that in the last days there will come times of Difficulty. The last days is a phrase that's used many times in the Bible, and it is used in a number of different ways in the Bible to refer to different times. And so if you add up all the different times that it's talking about, and if you simply go to places like Isaiah 2, Joel 2, Acts 2, Hebrews 1, 2 Peter chapter 3, and many others, you're going to find the phrase, in the last days. If you add them all up, it basically what it is, it's the span of days between the first coming of Jesus Christ. When he came, he, he took on flesh, he died for sin, he rose from the dead, he went to heaven, and his second coming, when he's gonna come back down and he's going to install a kingdom of righteousness and justice on the earth forever and ever and ever. It's the age of the church, this last days. We don't know how many days there are, but it's the span between those two moments and we happen to be living in them. The Bible is very clear that the closer we get to the very end of those days, the more difficult it will become. The word difficult is an interesting one. It's not used many times in the Bible, at least this, this form of the word. It's also used in Matthew chapter 8. There we find two people who are inhabited by demons. They have been possessed by demons. They're uncontrollable. It says that they're violent, and in their violence, they are fierce. Same word, fierce, difficult. He's saying that for those of us who have trusted Christ, who are in this age, who are part of his church, I'm assuming that's most of us, is that these days are going to become increasingly fierce and difficult. And this isn't the first warning that Paul has given to him about latter days. In his first letter that he wrote to him in the fourth chapter, he says, in latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. You say, well, what teachings of demons? What is that? Well, a few weeks ago, we looked at this and we looked at it extensively as when we went through Daniel and many other places, is that what you find in the Bible is there's great clarity that God Almighty is the source of all truth and he can never lie. And Satan is the father of lies and he can never tell the truth. And so God sends teachers and Satan sends false teachers. God sends the Christ, his son. Satan sends the antichrist. What's happening is demons are sent 
in order to inspire false teaching. This is what he's really talking about. It's teaching that is antithetical to the gospel. It's opposite of the gospel. It opposes the truth. They would tell people, you don't have to care about personal holiness. That you don't have to, to, to acknowledge the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. That you don't have to acknowledge the lordship of Christ, or you don't have to acknowledge the authority of the Bible. It's teachings of demons. In his second letter, the one that we're studying when we, in two weeks, when we get to chapter four, he's gonna say this. He says, the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. He's saying there is coming a time when people who claim to trust Christ, they no longer have tolerance for the truth of the Bible, and instead, they're going to accumulate teachers to tell them what they want to hear. So when you add those to this third warning in chapter 3, verse 1, where he says, understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, what he's saying is that false teachers dressed in godliness are going to creep into the church unnoticed. And because they are ungodly and worldly, they are going to introduce by their life and their teaching a worldliness that is typically only see, seen in the world, and it will become increasingly visible in the church. That's why you can go to places today that are called churches, and they are not going to believe in the authority of the Bible. They're not going to be believing in the exclusivity of Jesus Christ to save. They're not going to be teaching of God's call upon our life as that as we follow him, that we're all supposed to be pursuing purity and holiness. What he's saying is that the more we move in this direction, that Christ's very words are going to be rejected by the very people claiming to be his people. And that Christ himself, his name, what he stands for, what he loves, will be polarizing in his own church. That means that there is going to be churches who make their identity a lot of other things other than their love for Christ. And we see this all around. And he wants Timothy to understand why. He could have used the word know this. Know this is different than understand this. If I told you know my name, you found out it was Brian, mission accomplished. But if you were told, understand his name, now all of a sudden you may have to actually do some, some work to understand why my parents named me Brian and what Brian means, right? It's, it's, it's deeper than simply knowledge. It's understanding the causes and effects. And this is what he says. I want you to understand this. I want you to dig deeper into this. Don't just be satisfied with just, no, that's great. It's going to be terrible. All right. Move on. No, understand this. Understand why this is. Because those who understand why this is will not be held captive by it. You know, a tree has leaves and it has roots. And each one of us, when we see a tree, we only get to see the top part of it. When you see a false teacher, when you see a corrupt when you see counterfeit spirituality, you can only see the top. When you see a lifestyle that's marked by verses two through four, 18 characteristics of worldliness, what you see is the top of the tree. That's to know it. But if you want to understand it, you actually have to see what the roots are drinking. You have to dig down into the soil to to like to know a little bit more as to what is feeding this lifestyle, what's feeding this unbelief. And this is what this passage does for us, is it highlights three different root systems that feed this counterfeit spirituality so that we can understand it. 
And the first I want you to see, you see in verses two through four, is misdirected love. Now, I didn't put the reference up here, verses two through four, but that's what this is, okay? I didn't have enough space. I wanted it all to be in one slide, but I couldn't put those numbers in there. But it's two through four. And one of the things that you'll notice if you just look at this and if you just read it for yourself is there's only one word in here that is replicated more than once, and it's actually replicated five times. And it's the word or part of the word love. Love. Notice how it ends. He says they're not lovers of God. They're not lovers of God. And because they're not lovers of God, they're not lovers of the good. Jesus comes to the earth and he teaches us that the way for humans to experience flourishing is to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourself. That all of the instructions of the Bible boil down to one of those two, to love God and to love our neighbor as ourself. And so when we love God, what happens is we begin to love what is good. You be, if you begin loving God, you, you'll find yourself loving kindness. You're going to love mercy. You're going to love justice. You're going to love integrity. And the reason is because God is kind and just and merciful and full of integrity. You love him, you're going to start to love things that are like him, the things that he loves. But when we don't love God, our love gets misplaced. You don't stop loving. Your love is like a broken spigot. It's just pouring water in some direction. The question is not if you're going to love today, it's what you're going to love today. Same with me. We're going to love. And if we don't love God and we don't love what is good, we're going to love something else. And so what does he tell us is some of the placements of where we put our love, and he lists three of them. He says a love of self, he says a love of money, and a love of pleasure. And notice also that he doesn't use the word love of, he says lovers. Lovers is an interesting word because it adds identity. In other words, when, when you're a lover of something, is that it, is, it is your settled identity and it's your identity because of replicated behavior over and over and over and over again, which means if you love God, if you're a lover of God, it's different than loving God. If you're a lover of God, what it means is that today and yesterday and the day before that and that and that and that, it was a constant effort to continue to point all of my life and relationships and responsibilities in order to honor Jesus Christ. And suddenly people around, it goes, that person must love God. That becomes a, your identity as a lover of God. And so when that is replaced and removed from your life, you still become a lover of something. Whatever it is that you keep loving, you become a lover of that. And so what he's saying is that in each of these cases, these are like a settled disposition. This is their identity. This can become our identity if our love gets misplaced. He says, lover is a pleasure. You notice he says that it's not loving pleasure more than God, but he says rather than God. In other words, our love for pleasure is not exceeding our love for God. It is replacing our love for God. Lovers of money, this is greed. When we are a lover of money, what's happening is instead of leveraging money in order to love God and glorify God, we are leveraging money to indulge ourselves. We have to have more of it in order to supply all of our needs and desires. And then third, a love or being a lover of self. It's interesting and it's sad and tragic and there's evidence everywhere that today social scientists in America tell us that the central reason that we have all kinds of anxiety and all kinds of cultural conflict is due to a lack of self-love. We need self-esteem, we need self-awareness, we need self, we just need more of ourself. Friends, we are never more empty as when we're full of ourself. And so we hear every day, love yourself, you be you. You can't love others until you learn to love yourself. The Bible never tells us to love ourselves. 
He just assumes that we do. We're fallen. When we fell, our relational computer broke, and suddenly what was the ethic of the garden was my life for your good became your life for my good. We become lovers of self. This is about me. You're here to revolve around my world. You're driving in my space. Isn't it interesting you get mad at traffic? You're a part of traffic. You just assume they're all where you don't want them to be. Lovers of self. Friends, I want you to know that we have conflict at every level of our society because lovers of self cannot live peacefully with other lovers of self. There's not enough oxygen left in the room. If everything is my agenda, my way, my desire, and you are in a relationship with someone else, that it's about my relation, my desire, my everything. You have two people saying my, and suddenly the relationship will die. And so what comes, you see, if this is the roots, what, what are the fruits? And all the rest of this are the fruits. Just imagine these words. Pride is thinking about ourself. Arrogance is boasting about ourself. Abuse is the misuse of our strength to exploit for our desires somebody else in their weakness. Disobedient to their parents. No. Why should I obey my parents when this is my world? And they just have the privilege to just live in my world and Feed me when I'm ready and care for me when I'm ready and give me money when I'm ready. The lover of self, rejection of God-given authority, ungratefulness. This is a great one. Proud people rarely say thank you. And the reason is because they simply assume that all the blessings that they're receiving are wages being delivered because they're awesome. So someone makes you a meal. It happens to be a meal they they always make. Let's just say they always make you breakfast or always make you dinner. You stop saying thank you. Why? It's because you're a lover of self. You don't deserve that. And so what happens is you start going through life, and when you're full of yourself, what happens is that the good things that you experience, you simply assume that I'm due them, and so why say thank you for them? Unholy, which means irreverent, heartless, the lack of compassion towards others because we have such enormous compassion for our own time, our own energy, our own strength, our own calendar. Unappeasable, it means it's never enough. You can never give enough. You can never serve enough, serve me enough. Slanderous is to tear other people down in order to lift yourself up. Without self-control, you have urgent desires, important desires, and urgent desires say, mine are more important. Brutal is to be beast-like. Treacherous is to be disloyal. Because when you get into it, and you got to save your own, I might as well be disloyal. Reckless is to be insensitive. Swollen with conceit is to be puffed up. And don't you see all this behavior is antisocial? This is why relationships break down. When we lose our love of God and our love for what is good, we become a lover of self, money, and pleasure. And when we become a lover of self, money, and pleasure, there are all kinds of fruits that are destructive to our relationships. And so one of the roots is misdirected love. The second is empty religion. You see this in verse 5. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power, avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. In other words, these false teachers or these believers, I should say these professing believers, they put on the garb of godliness to be able to fit in so they can creep around unnoticed. What that means is they know all the words to the song, but they never worship. They are, as Jesus said, a lamp without oil. 
I talk about this one all the time because it just captures my attention. But Jesus told a parable about 10 women waiting for the bridegroom to come. And they all have a job. When he arrives, they all have a lamp. And they're supposed to trim their lamp, light it up, so that when the bridegroom comes, who's all represented of Jesus, is that there's light. And they're supposed to let their light shine. So they all have a lamp. They're all carrying it around. They all look identical. Five of them have oil in the lamp and five of them don't, which means that five of them have the capacity to be able to do their job description when Christ comes back and five of them are just a facade. They're just holding a lamp. And yet until that fateful day when Christ comes and we actually see what's in the lamp, the oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. When we're born again, when we're transformed, we put our faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into our heart, and suddenly we have this empowerment by the Spirit to love and to, and to be joyful and to bear fruit and to shine light into the world. In that moment, you have the Holy Spirit, you can shine, but here's the thing. Until that day, no one has to light their light. Everyone just has to go to church. So we walk around. There's a whole bunch of us here today. We all got a little lantern. We're just walking around. It's not lit up. We're just walking around. We know the songs. We know the words. It's so possible to walk around and know everything and give the impression to everyone around us, including ourselves, that we're actually a part when, in fact, what we're really doing is simply holding the emptiness of human religion. Is there oil in your heart? Is the Holy Spirit living within you? Are you born again? These false teachers, they will masquerade in godliness. They will give the impression that they are moral people. They'll tell you enough of the gospel to assume, to, so that you begin to assume that what they're teaching is what you're believing. You notice that they creep into households with the agenda to capture weak men and women. Now, he says women. I don't believe this is characterization of all women in general. But what's interesting is this. In this day and time, I'm not trying to explain this way. I don't know why he didn't add men and women. But I do know that women at this time, they stayed home. I also know that throughout the letter, he keeps calling out false teachers by name and saying that they are developing a following. So maybe he knows specifically some women that he and Timothy have identified talking about who at a moment of their own vulnerability were burdened with their own sins, which means that they were feeling guilty and they needed someone to encourage them. They were led astray by various passions. They still wanted to do that and suddenly someone swoops in in that moment and they have the appearance of godliness and they have the appearance of the gospel and they are led astray. This is not just women. The men and women that are susceptible are the weak and unprotected among the men and women. But one of the roots is empty religion. And finally, opposition to truth. You see in verses 8 and 9, he says, Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men of corrupted mind and disqualified regarding the faith, but they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. Who are these two men? They're only mentioned here in the Bible. But Paul is pulling from the annals of Jewish history and from a book called the Targum in order to make his point. You remember Moses? God calls Moses to go to Pharaoh in order to lead the people of Israel out of slavery from Egypt, and so... And so they go, and Moses says, wait, before I go, I'm going to get there. He's a big dude and really powerful, and he's not going to like what I say, so I need a sign. I need something that's going to verify that I'm coming on behalf of God. He goes, I'll tell you what, throw your staff on the ground. It becomes a snake, and he goes, that's impressive. So he goes to Pharaoh, and he goes, you got to let my people go. Show me why. Throws it down, staff, becomes a snake. And all of a sudden, Pharaoh goes, I got two magicians also. And the Talgum says that they're Janus and Jambres who oppose Moses. And it's amazing. Three miracles in, they're matching what 
Moses is doing in the power of God by their dark arts. And, and then all of a sudden they run out of gas. And they start saying, you know what, look, I, I mean, like we've thrown all the tricks that we got. We've got nothing left. And he just keeps multiplying more and more miracles and plagues. And it became plain to all that they were not the ultimate authority in the room. And so what he's saying, he's drawing from this story in order to say, these false teachers, what's going to happen is they're going to come into your space and they're going to oppose the truth by proclaiming another gospel. But here's what's going to happen. There's going to come a time when they're going to run out of gas when they don't have the authority, and it's going to be very clear to people who have the discernment because their roots are anchored in the gospel that this is somebody that we don't have to listen to. It's going to be plain to all. But there's an opposition of the truth. And so he tells us to understand the roots of counterfeit spirituality. A love, empty religion, and opposition to truth. Now, it takes a whole lot more time to be understanding and to avoid something once you understand it. So the second point is going to be a whole lot shorter than the first, and that is to avoid the infection of counterfeit spirituality. As a people, we are supposed to love people, pray for people, plead for people, encourage people, forgive people, teach people, bear with the burdens of people. But when people have an unrepentant resolve, a determination to stay in their sin, verse 5 tells us that we are to avoid such people. We are not to avoid unbelievers who are trapped in the sins that we read about in verses two through four because they need the gospel. Nor are we to avoid believers who are fighting against these sins because we are all marred by sin. All of us. But you find a professing believer who rejects the truth, who denies the power of God, who denies the exclusivity of Jesus, who denies the authority of the Bible, who refuses to repent and who encourages others to do the same, avoid them. Their obsession to fight the gospel does not have to become your obsession. Avoid them. So let me close with a few applications and then we're going to sing. First, let me urge us, in light of this, to examine our lives for true spirituality. Isn't it true that our instinct, when you read a list like this, is to circle the wagons in order to keep it out? The problem is, all this stuff lives in the heart, and we're all here. We're all here. And so where do we start? We start the most important, am I born again? Paul says, examine yourself to see whether you were in the faith. Are you hoping today in anything other than the death and resurrection, his righteousness for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life? Are you born again? You say, how do I know if I'm born again? Well, how do you know if you're born? How do you know if you're born? You look in a mirror or you breathe, all right? That's all evidence that you were born. You look for evidence of physical life. How do you know if you're born again? You look for evidence of spiritual life. You can read 1 John, and what you find there is lots of different evidences of spiritual life. Conviction of sin. That means if you can sin against one of God's instructions and feel no impulse of regret, that's really problematic. The Holy Spirit who lives within our heart hates our sin. He lets us know that he hates our sin inside of us by causing us to feel guilt. You can sin and not feel guilty. That is the problem. Love for people, a love for the brothers, a love for worship, a love for scripture, an understanding of scripture, all of these are evidences. And then let me encourage you to examine your love. Do you love Christ? You say, well, how would I know if I love Christ? Well, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He says in John 15, you are my friends if you do what I command. So let me ask you again, do you love Christ? It has nothing to do if you're here. That's no sign. He says, you'll know that you love me if when you hear what I ask you to do, if you do it. And so examine yourself. Second, let me urge you to examine those who have influence in your life, your teachers, your pastor, 
the authors that you read, people who, who you download, you're listening to. Let me encourage you to check a few things. Check their character. If you look at their life, you see no pursuit of faith, love, or purity, I would encourage you to avoid them. Check their doctrine. What do they teach? Do you need a Bible to follow along when they teach? Some of us, we just read so many books. The best books in the world are books you have to have an open Bible while you read that book. And then check their followers because people often adopt a teacher's passion. You should check. Is there a passion among people who consistently listen to this person for Jesus, for the gospel, for the Bible, for prayer, for mission, for loving one another, for humility? Third, let me encourage us to confess that following Christ is the better way. (laughs) When you look at this list, emulating this worldly lifestyle is seen in verses two through four. It's like living on the floor of a gas station bathroom. It's disgusting. Did you know you don't have to live like this? Jesus died so that you don't have to live like verses two through four. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works, which means that when we have a love for Christ, it develops a love for what is good and it creates the opposite effect of everything that we read about in our text so that instead of being a lover of self, we become a lover of others. Instead of being a lover of money, we become a lover of generosity. Instead of being abusive, we're kind. The list goes on. The opposite of all of this text is what's available to us in Jesus Christ. And so I urge you today, have you ever trusted Christ? Would you put your trust in him today? And if you have, are you walking with him? This is what's available. Don't leave this on the table. Pick it up and use it. Finally, let's become durable for difficult days. There are difficult days coming. So I urge you to drive the roots of your life into the gospel and take hope because Jesus said in the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. For those of you who have never put your trust in Christ, I beg you this morning, not for my benefit or knowledge, but for yours, would you confess Christ as Lord? Would you bow your heart to him and acknowledge that you have a debt you can't pay and acknowledge to him that he paid that debt on your behalf? Would you acknowledge to him that you're putting your whole trust in him and confess him as Lord? I urge you today, now, to call out to him in faith. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we bow before you and we thank you for this warning. It's uncomfortable and in many ways convicting, but we thank you for it. We know that you've preserved it because it's good for us, and so thank you for it. And God, as a church family, we want to endure. We want to to be protected. We desire to hold fast to the gospel. We desire to hold fast to Jesus And we know from the pages of Scripture that the reason that we have confidence today that we can is because you are the one who is holding fast to us. So as we sing about that truth today, would you encourage our hearts and renew our enthusiasm as we respond to what we've heard by singing to you these words. We pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand? Let's sing.
will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raise with Our grip on the Lord is shaky. His grip on us never wanes. He is holding us, friends. So as we continue to sing, let's let our guard down and rest in the promises of Christ, his love for us, his presence with us. Let's sing. Yes, I'll remember. 
Well, praise the Lord that this reality is true. Jesus has done everything that we need in order to be safe in times of trouble. And he's given all of the grace that is required for us to overcome our wrongdoing. If you're here and maybe you'd like to learn more or maybe you just would like some help in finding your next step towards Jesus, we'd love to be able to help you with that. You've got the blue card and the seat back in front of you. You can fill that out and you can take that to the welcome desk where we have people who would love to meet you and would love to talk with you and pray with you. Or you can go to pray.org slash connect and you can leave your information there and we will reach out to you soon. Well, a few things that I would love for us to consider as we get ready to head out from this place. The first thing is, is we've just completed our first week of our 28 days of prayer as a church. And we really believe that uh, God is going to move in a very meaningful way during this time. So I want to invite you to continue to pursue God this week through prayer together. Secondly, we're going to be gathering here in just a couple of weeks on Saturday, October 21st for our City Serve Rally. You can go to pray.org slash city serve where you can learn about all the different projects that we have going on all around the city and you can register and get involved with one of them. Our hope here at Providence is that everyone would extend themselves to the point of discomfort in order to reach and bless and love Raleigh and the whole Triangle community. And city serve is a great way for you to do that. So pray.org slash city serve for more information and to register. And then lastly, uh, it's been a great morning as we've had parents who have come forward to dedicate their children to the Lord. Uh, we are passionate here at Providence about reaching kids and pointing them towards Christ. And so we're super excited that tonight we are launching a brand new opportunity for kids ages three through fifth grade, and it's called Kids Connect. There we're going to teach God's word. We are going to sing and worship together. We're going to memorize scripture. There's going to be games. It's going to be fun. It's going to be high energy. But the whole idea is we want to help kids connect to each other and even more importantly, to connect to God. So that's going to happen every Sunday night, 6 to 7.30, same time that our students are meeting here on campus. Uh, so you can go to pray.org for more information or to register your child, or you can just show up tonight at 6. We're going to have registration and check-in over in the kids' atrium so you can park and enter through that door back there on the south side of the building. Well, let me pray for us, and then we'll head out this morning. Father God, we thank you. We praise you. Um, God, our hearts are just filled with joy as we get to come together we get to sing praises to your name and worship you because of who you are and what you've done and what we see you doing. God, I pray that you would be with us this week as we go out. God, I pray that we would take stock of our lives, that we would see the fruit that is coming from it or where it is lacking. God, I pray that you would convict us of where our eyes are not set and focused on you and turn our attention back to you. So God, I pray that you would move and that you would act through us. God, that we would be a gospel light in the community around us this week. So we just ask for your hand and we ask for your blessing. We love you. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.